All right, so we're moving into our last section on disorders of female reproductive physiology, and we're going to talk about disorders of menstrual symptoms. So the first two symptoms we're going to talk about are PMS and PMDD. What, does, what do I mean by that? All right, so PMS is premenstrual syndrome, and we know it occurs to at least a little bit in the vast majority of female-bodied people. These symptoms usually begin anywhere from three to 10 days before the onset of their period, and then go away either right when they start bleeding or within the first couple of days of their period. So there's a lot of physical symptoms, so cramps and backache, nausea, dizziness, fatigue, breast tenderness, tingling or swelling in the hands and feet, weight gain from water retention, acne, migraine, headaches, and there are emotional symptoms as well, right? So tension, irritability, depression, anxiety, food cravings, although some of that, especially like a week to 10 days before your period, might be because of the increased caloric requirements of that endometrial lining uh, or lack of concentration. So this can definitely happen definitely does happen and we think it's due to either the high levels of hormones that happen kind of in the mid to late luteal phase or the rapid drop in hormonal levels that happens right at the end of the luteal phase right before menstruation and we know that both estrogen and progesterone affect the neurons the cells in our brain including those cells that release neurotransmitters like serotonin norepinephrine GABA and endorphins and so we know that there is a direct physiological uh, action of the hormones on our brain cells, which is probably why many of these symptoms occur. PMDD is kind of like a worse form of PMS. So in about 5% of female-bodied people, they have severe emotional symptoms. And they're severe enough that they cause impairment of their normal daily functioning. So they can't go to work, they can't study, they can't hang out with their friends because they just feel so awful. And they've studied these folks and found out that when they measure their hormone levels, they have more severe hormonal fluctuations than do people who don't have this severe emotional response. So it makes sense, right? So this is not common. It happens in about 5% of people, but it also means it's not terribly uncommon either. So what do we do to help people manage this? Well, so it's amazing to what extent supporting your brain in general can be helpful. So things like getting regular exercise and good sleep of eight to nine hours of uninterrupted sleep per night, uh, eating nutritious foods, avoiding caffeine, staying away from really salty or sugary foods, avoiding alcohol. It is amazing how much of a difference these things can make on your overall brain health and therefore on your mood and ability to kind of withstand uh, these levels of hormones. The other thing that can be helpful sometimes is to keep a log of symptoms because if you keep a kind of like a regular calendar or journal then you can start to see, oh my gosh, I'm feeling so awful. The world is horrible. Life is never going to be good again. But if you look and you see, oh, I'm due for my period in a day or two, sometimes that can be a little helpful to give you some distance from it and be like, oh, this too shall pass. This is just the PMDD. It's not that my life really is horrible. It's just that I'm having this hormonal storm right now that's affecting my mood. So logging and keeping track of symptoms can be helpful. And sometimes we'll use serotonin medicines like fluoxetine, which is branded as Prozac, um, and other antidepressants to help level out those neurotransmitter levels and sometimes too we'll use hormonal therapies right to kind of even out their hormone levels and keep them at a more consistent level instead of having these really large fluctuations as they come into the premenstrual time so that's PMDD we're going to now move on to so those are kind of mental emotional and general physical symptoms now we're going to talk about symptoms more related kind of locally to the uterus and where it is so our first one is dysmenorrhea 
dysmenorrhea means painful periods. <laughs> so, you know, more than half of female bodied people on average have at least some pain with their periods due to that myometrium contracting. But if it's severe enough to interfere with normal activities, we call it dysmenorrhea, right? So I like this image. Meanwhile, in my uterus, right, it just feels like it's just like, ah! It's all going crazy and it's just a huge battle in there, right? So sometimes this can be so painful that people are really incapacitated. It can be so painful that people pass out from the pain. It can be so painful that people are nauseated and vomiting from the pain. Like it can be a real disability for people. Um, it can be truly severe. Um, so this is a little video that I do recommend you check out. It's kind of interesting. I'll put the link in the, the description for this YouTube recording. All right. So what causes dysmenorrhea? So for most people, it's what we call primary dysmenorrhea, meaning there's not something else causing it. There's not another problem with the uterus. You just have painful periods. This tends to be inherited, meaning genetic, so it tends to run in families. And what we find in people who have this is that they have really high levels of prostaglandins in your uterus, in their uterus. And so prostaglandins are chemical molecules in our bodies that mediate pain. They also are important for dilation of the cervix during childbirth and they're important for uterine contractions. So it kind of makes sense that if prostaglandins cause the myometrium to contract, if you have really high levels of prostaglandins, your uterus is contracting really, really hard and really, really forcefully. So it makes sense that that would be one of the potential causes of dysmenorrhea or the se severe menstrual cramps. Secondary causes means there's something else going on in the uterus. So endometriosis, which we mentioned earlier with ovarian cysts, and we talked about those blood-filled cysts called endometriomas, can cause this, as well as some other uterine conditions. But we're just going to talk a little bit about endometriosis because it's fairly common and you might be curious about it. So endometriosis means that endometrial tissue is growing in places where it doesn't belong. So we say it's ectopic endometrial tissue. Ectopic means out of place. And this is really irritating to your inner organ. So in this image here, right, we've got some endometrial tissue growing on the perimetrium, right, on the outside of the uterus or the outside of the fallopian tubes or the outside of the ovaries. And blood, if you drop blood into somebody's abdominal or pelvic cavity, it's really, really irritating and it can cause a lot of pain and over time it can also cause scarring. So if the blood is, stays in the endometrium and then just gets pushed out uh, by the myometrium, you know, during a menstrual period, that's fine. But if you have blood in these other places, that's really irritating to the body and can cause a lot of pain. So as you can imagine, these are these little tiny implants of endometrial tissue. Oftentimes, the only way to know for sure that someone has endometriosis is to do a surgery and go in and look and see them, right? A lot of times we will presumptively diagnose somebody with endometriosis, but unless they've had a surgery, we don't actually know for sure that that's what they have most of the time. Sometimes there can be some ultrasound findings that are suggestive. All right, so here's an example of looking inside somebody's body. I need to erase those. Oops. All right, here's two examples, all right, of looking inside people's bodies uh, at surgery. And so in the upper image, you can see they've labeled the uterus, and you can see the left ovarian tube and ovary and the right tube and ovary. I want to point out a couple of other structures here because I think it's really interesting. So this right here is the ovarian ligament, right? This over here is the fallopian tube. So again, over here is the fallopian tube. Here is the ovarian ligament. And you can even see here is the round ligament that's attaching the uterus to the front wall of the body. So in this particular individual, you can see it's just this little spot of blood, right? Because endometrial tissue will respond to hormones wherever it is, whether it's on the inner lining of your uterus or out on the outside of your uterus, it will do its thing and it will break down and bleed as you get your period. So this is really irritating. So here's another image and you can see all these little hemorrhages, right? All this bleeding that's happening in places where it doesn't belong. 
So dysmenorrhea can be due to primary dysmenorrhea, where you have those high prostaglandin levels, tends to run in family, or due to endometriosis, or due to a couple of other problems with the uterus. But in general, we're going to treat it the same for most people. So as long as it's not due to some type of infection like chlamydia, we have several treatments that we can offer. So a, a heating pad or a hot pack actually can be enormously helpful. Um, so sometimes we tend to poo-poo these things that are non-pharmaceutical, right? But they actually can be really helpful. So uh, a very good investment for people who have dysmenorrhea is one of those microwavable hot packs can make a huge difference. Also, anti-prostaglandin medicine. So we talked about how the prostaglandins cause these extra forceful contractions of the myometrium. And you may not have realized that Advil or ibuprofen, Motrin or Naprosyn, which is Aleve, those are anti-prostaglandin medicines. And they can be really helpful for treating dysmenorrhea, especially if you take them starting as soon as or right before you start getting cramps and take them regularly, so three times a day Day if that's what's on the box for like ibuprofen or twice a day for naproxen for several days so that then your body can't produce prostaglandins much at all. They can be really, really helpful, but you want to make sure to kind of start taking them early and take them frequently um, and you can stay ahead of the pain that way. Interestingly, ginger supplements have been shown to be just as effective as even prescription strength ibuprofen, uh, which is pretty cool and amazing. So uh, ginger at about 500 milligrams three times a day is really helpful. Um, you would need to take a supplement to get that much. Um, you know, no matter what your favorite Thai curry is, it probably doesn't have that much ginger in it. We can also use hormonal contraceptives because when we put someone on hormonal birth control like the pill or other things, that changes the whole menstrual cycle. And so the periods that they have are uh, very different and less severe. We can also use hormonal contraceptives to make somebody not have periods anymore at all. So that's a very common treatment for dysmenorrhea. We can also use pain medicine. So Tylenol is not an anti-prostaglandin medicine, but it is a pain medicine that can be effective and added to the ibuprofen. And we try to avoid narcotic pain medicines like Tylenol with codeine or anything like that because they can be very addictive. So this is all of that information um, in text in case you wanted to kind of check some of your notes or read more about it. The next disorder of symptoms, we've talked about PMS and its evil extreme cousin, PMDD, and we've talked about dysmenorrhea, which is severe pain with periods. Now we're going to talk about menorrhagia, which is a strange word. Now, menorrhagia is heavy periods, right? So these are people who lose more than 80 cc's of blood uh, with their period, right? And so people who have this kind of know because they have large menstrual blood loss, right? So there's a lot coming out, not quite as much as pictured here, um, but they lose a lot. And so this is another video that I'll also link. Um, it's kind of interesting. So how would you know, right? Since most people do not have a little measuring cup to see how much blood is coming out of their vagina with their menstrual period. So some signs that you have especially heavy periods would be the following. So if you soak through a pad or tampon in one to two hours consecutively for several hours, that's a really heavy period. So most people will not. Most people on their heaviest day, a pad or tampon will probably last them about three to four hours or longer. So if you're having to change every one to two hours, if you can't get through a two hour class without having to get up and go change, that's an indication that you probably have heavy periods. If you need to double up, right? So if you're like, okay, I'm gonna put in a super plus tampon and a pad so that I can not have to run to the bathroom for the next two or three hours, that's a good sign that your periods are heavier than typical. Also needing to get up and change your feminine hygiene product during the night. That's unusual in people who don't have heavy periods. Um, usually people who don't have heavy periods, they don't lose a lot of uh, menstrual blood during the night, so it's not an issue. 
If your overall menstrual duration is more a week or longer, then the likelihood that you're losing a larger amount of blood is higher or if you pass really large blood clots. So it's not typical to pass um, blood clots with menstrual flow unless you have heavy periods. And blood clots look kind of like, um, pardon the um, analogy to a food product, but kind of like clumps of grape jelly a little bit, but thicker. Um, so that would be a sign that these are heavy periods. Or if you're not doing things, if you're not going uh, for a walk with your friends, or if you're not, gonna, if you skip class or you miss class just because you're just bleeding so much, right? That That's a sign things are a little different than typical. And um, finally, if you have symptoms of anemia, right, of having not enough blood, so feeling really tired, um, getting fatigued easily, short of breath. In some people, the anemia can become quite significant. I once had a patient whose menorrhagia was so severe that by the time she finally came into the doctor's office and came in to see me, I checked her blood count. And so one of the things, because she looked awful, she was like so pale. And so one of the things that we measure as blood count is hematocrit, and that should be 36%. Hers was 18. So she had lost half of her blood volume from heavy periods and was trying to, you know, she was in middle school, she was trying to live her life and get through her day and just couldn't figure out why she was so exhausted, right? You can lose quite a lot of blood this way. All right, so what causes it? Well, sometimes it's primary or idiopathic, meaning we don't know, it just happens. Sometimes it can be due to endometriosis or other problems with the uterus. Sometimes it can be due to a blood clotting problem, either one that is inherited or due to taking certain medications like high doses of aspirin. It can also be caused by hormonal problems. So interestingly, people who don't ovulate regularly, right? So people who have hypothalamic amenorrhea or have PCOS, uh, they are more likely to sometimes when they do have periods to have really heavy periods. Also people with thyroid problems can have menorrhagia, really heavy periods. So again, medications, um, there are some herbal products that can thin your blood and cause this, and um, some infections can cause it as well. The treatments, interestingly, anti-prostaglandin medicines like ibuprofen and naproxen are helpful for this too. Also interesting, hormonal contraceptives by changing the way your periods work can also be really helpful. So this is sounding familiar. Now there are surgical treatments that are available. Um, so there's an ablation, which is kind of like a cauterization, or uh, hysterectomy, getting your uterus removed, but we're not gonna do that unless someone's sure that they don't ever wanna get pregnant, right? Those, those are kind of big things, and it then makes it so you would not be able to be pregnant in the future. And then of course, if somebody has signs of anemia, we're gonna wanna make sure they take iron supplements or have an iron rich diet, so lots of red meat to help them be able to recover and make new bread blood cells. So um, dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia, right, painful periods and heavy periods, they had a lot in common in terms of both some of their potential causes as well as their treatments. And in fact, these two disorders often go together for extra fun. <laughs> All right, so here's the kind of the causes, right? And so menorrhagia just has the extra of um, blood clotting problems or hormonal problems on the treatments, right? So those anti-prostaglandin medicines work for both conditions. Hormonal contraception works for both conditions. Um, iron supplements we would only recommend if you need them. So because of the fact that the same treatments work for both of these conditions, no matter what's causing them, anytime a person comes to us who has dysmenorrhea and or menorrhagia, we're going to actually treat them what's called empirically. We're not gonna do a huge diagnostic workup. We're not gonna do surgery on them because surgery is risky because it wouldn't change what we would do. We would start with the same types of treatments, right? We would start with ibuprofen or hormonal contraception and see if we can get things under control because these things are not aside from 
the impairment in daily functioning that they cause, they're not dangerous um, unless you get really anemic. But so as long as we can control these symptoms, then that's all we really need to do um, in the vast majority of these circumstances. So we don't usually do a huge diagnostic workup. We just go ahead and treat them. All right, so summary. So PMS and PMDD are body and or mood symptoms due to those hormonal changes that are occurring in the late luteal phase coming into the menses. And then dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia often occur together and they respond to the same types of treatments. So we don't do a lot of definitive testing. We just treat people empirically for those. So hopefully, I know a lot of you probably have some of these conditions, so hopefully that was helpful. All right, that's it for female abnormalities.